for that announcement. Uh, there's a homework. Homework six is due uh, next Tuesday, which also happens to be the last uh, uh, lecture. And uh, on that day, you'll have a homework and your project submissions due. But just as a reminder, the project window is open till the end of the exam period. Um, there's a final exam next Thursday. Um, that will be um, at 10.30. It will be for two hours. And um, it will be right here. And it's going to cover everything that we did in the second half of the semester, plus all of learning theory. There's a question on Zoom. Can we have the LaTeX file for homework six? I was certain that we posted it. Um, if not, I'll have one of my TAs look at it. Um, I'm surprised. I thought we had already posted it last week. Uh, any other questions? Yes. I have some questions about how complicated the number of So we talked about, you, you gave like a kind of hint in the homework, but like, it's kind of vague. And yes. I'm having a hard time understanding like how you intuited that. Yeah, so that, that's, a, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, there are questions on Zoom. I'll um, I'll uh, get to that in a minute. So uh, the question is, how do you know what's a good number of epochs? And are you asking this with respect to your homework or your project or more generally? Yeah. Uh, the general right answer is we don't know. Uh, there's another right answer, which is infinity. So neither of those are useful. So let's kind of talk about practical stuff. Uh, so... What we are doing here is we are solving an optimization problem. And our goal is to get to the minimum of some objective function. So then the question is, how close do you want to get to the minimum? So if you stop early, it's possible that you might end up what is called underfitting the data. If you stop late, you might end up overfitting the data because you might get end up optimizing the objective a little too well. And so sometimes, the, the this is why there's no clear answer here because sometimes the sweet spot for when to stop can decide um, how well your model generalizes. So that's one sort of a uh, complication. Another issue is uh, so so there are a few different ways of uh, uh, approaching this. One is to just say that I don't know. I'm just going to pick ten. Ten sounds like a good number. So let me run it for ten epochs and. Let's hope it works. Another answer is I'm going to run it uh, till convergence. What does convergence mean? You can, uh, and, I, and I'll talk about that actually a fair bit on uh, next Tuesday's lecture. But imagine that you plot the objective function as the, uh, as the training proceeds. So on this axis, you could have epochs or even the number of updates the number of objects you make to the model. And on this axis, you can plot the loss. So if you plot this curve, you're minimizing the loss function. So uh, hopefully, that's the general trajectory of the curve will be down. But you're using a stochastic optimizer, which means you'll not get a smooth curve down. You get like a wiggly sort of a curve down. Now, let's say we have a curve that looks like this. Where would you stop learning? Let's say you're able to run it all the way to the end, and then you can go back and pick a stopping point. What would you pick if you had to choose? And you can just point and say, like, you know, uh, let, somewhere around here, maybe. Why did you pick that? Because after that, you gain a little bit, but. And that's exactly the procedure that we used. That's a procedure that you, so you train it for more epochs than necessary and then go back and pick a point where, uh, pick a stopping point. That's one answer. Another answer is, um, but, but, but even then, let's say, you would agree that maybe stopping here is a little too early because there's still a while to go. And maybe stopping here versus stopping here makes no difference because they are kind of roughly the same. So the, you look for you look for a place where the curve plateaus, and uh, that's a reasonable stopping point because beyond that you're doing extra work for no good. Okay, another approach is you don't you plot a different curve. On the horizontal axis, you have exactly the same things: epochs or updates. 
on the vertical axis, you have a performance, and I'll talk about that in a minute, on validation set, also known as the depth set. Performance could be the actual metric that you care about. It could be accuracy or F score or um, you know the, the squared error or anything that you're going to measure on future examples. And here maybe what might happen is the curve, again, it's stochastic, so it will be a, a bumpy. Where would you stop now? First of all, why is it going down and then going up? It's overfitting the training data. It's overfitting the training data. The development or validation yeah. is data that is not visible to the learning algorithm. So after a certain point, it's getting bad. So where would you stop here? What's a good number of, what's a good stopping criteria? Lowest. The lowest point, where after which um, the, the the curve becomes worse. So the sorry, the, the performance becomes worse. So this is another sort of a heuristic for picking a stopping criterion. Even here, you're doing the same thing. You are shooting fast, and then in hindsight, picking a point that looked good uh, according to this criterion. Yes, is it possible for this point uh, is a fast for the validation, but uh, not the fast for the test, right? It's possible, but that can that that suggests that your validation set and your test set are not uh, 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 representatives of the true distribution. One or the other, or maybe both, are not representatives of the true distribution uh, of the data. So the data sets are not like each other. If they are actually IID and sampled from the true data distribution and are large enough, then it's unlikely to happen. My observation on this happened in the project data set. Possibly, yes. Uh, the, and it's not, it's not unheard of. Yeah. Now, in both of these cases, uh, what I'm suggesting here is a heuristic that says train fast, like, you know, train for uh, uh, way more number of epochs than necessary. And then in hindsight, pick a number of epochs and then choose the model from there which is actually a bit of an engineering effort because you need to train all the way through, keep track of this value, the loss or the performance all the way for every step, for every epoch, and then plot the curve and then decide uh, uh, afterwards. That seems like a large effort. Also, it seems a bit subjective if I'm looking at a curve and plotting the thing, how do you know when, uh, uh, you know, the, the eyeballing it is not never a good algorithm. So in terms of procedure, what you do is you keep track of this value, let's say loss. You keep track of, oh, you keep track of a loss value here. And then after, let's say, um, use black, some loss value uh, at every epoch. And then you measure the difference between the current epoch and the previous. And if that difference, the absolute value of the difference is less than some number, you declare that learning is done. So that means that the loss is converging. And that number, is like it's, it's a stopping criterion. Um, let's give it a name. Let's call it epsilon. And let's say epsilon is maybe 10 power minus 2. If the absolute change in loss between across epochs is less than some threshold, um, then you stop training. For example, a popular machine learning library called Linear, it, is, it doesn't use stochastic gradient descent, it uses uh, another learning algorithm called dual coordinate descent. It um, has an epsilon of 10 power minus 7 or 10 power minus 8 or something, something incredibly small. Notice that all I have done here is instead of picking a number of epochs as a default, I'm picking this epsilon as a default value. So it's training of one constant for another. The short answer, once again, going back, is there is no one right answer here. There is a little bit of uh, staring at the data and picking a, a good threshold. Now, for your homework, um, this can be more work than you care to uh, do. So you can use uh, a strategy that is untuned. So for example, you can run it for 20 epochs and say that you've just done that. And if it works, it works. Does that 
Yes. One question is that if I register the some library use the data to be like the ten to the minus not the data, it's the loss. Yes. Uh, the change in loss function between at, so yeah, it's like if loss as at epoch number t yeah. minus loss at epoch t minus one divided by loss at t minus one. Like, uh, uh, and let's take the this. Uh, let's take the absolute value of this. Mm -hmm. If this is less than epsilon, then you say that learning is done. But uh, you said that a number in the library is like uh, it's a small number. Yes. But uh, that that will call something mm -hmm. that cost overfitting. Uh, uh, that it will cost overfitting provided you don't use the regular drives. So the, the it's possible that it it could cause overfitting. But if you have a regularizer in place, that can help because SVM has a regularizer. So you choose the hyperparameter for the regularizer to avoid overfitting. If you do that for training errors, if you, if you plot the performance on the training data and do that, you will you are guaranteed overfitting. Um, with a linear classifier, with SVM specifically, with a regularizer, it's okay because you have the regularizer that prevents overfitting. Yeah, when we do a training, we should also include the regularizer. Of course, the loss includes the regularizer. Yeah, I'm also watching that. Uh, I'm also thinking that the regularizer to reduce the overfit, but uh, when I when I see as if I try a lot of effort, the overfit is still happening. It's hard to avoid overfit. Yes, there's a bunch of questions on uh, Zoom. I'll get to that and then come back to you. Um. Will late submissions to Kaggle be accepted without penalty? They will be accepted, but then remember that Kaggle submissions end on the 25th or the 26th. Uh, after that, I can't change it. So you, you do get a few more days uh, on Kaggle, but also uh, not all the way to the end of the exam period. Uh, for project, for homework six, we have the same, wait, just to confirm again for the project, for our six uh, algorithms, we have, to, we have the same algorithm for two of them, as long as they use different features, that's fine. That's okay. Yeah, and that's correct. Um, can we have a sample final exam? Will you'll have a you'll get a uh, uh, just like with the midterm, you'll get an overcomplete list of questions. I think um, maybe uh, I have to see if uh, I'll be able to do that. You'll get like a study guide for sure. Um, how do you perform cross validation on the project? We already have split the data into test, train, and evaluation. Are you allowed to do cross-validation? You are allowed to do cross-validation. You have to split the training set on your own into six parts or five parts, K parts, however number. Um, homework six LaTeX files are on Canvas right now. How do we update the bias for SVM? On the slides, there isn't a bias term. Is it not needed? The answer is you do need the bias. In fact, it's extremely important that the bias exists. And on the slides, uh, I think I mentioned this in class, we did not discuss the bias term because I assumed that the weight vector was really the weight and the bias together. And that this was uh, similarly the feature is whatever was the original feature and the number one. So W prime. W prime transpose X prime is nothing but W transpose X plus B. And the update, the SVM update in that we saw in the class was on these uh, modified weights and features where the bias term was folded into the weight. So if you kind of unfold those two things, what we saw in the class was if W transpose X plus B, well, W transpose X is less than equal to one, then W, is W plus some learning rate. I'm just calling it an R times, oh, not plus, it's a minus here. W something like this. Uh, did I get this wrong? No, that's not a W here. Yeah, which is, W times one minus R plus R C Y X. But if you trans, and then there's the else 
কি হবে ইফ ইউ ট্রান্সলেট দিস টু দ্য কেস ওয়ার অল অফ দিস ওয়ার ইন দ্য কেস অফ অ্যাজুমিং দ্যাট দ্য ডাব ওয়েটস কন্টেইন দ্য অ্যান এক্সট্রা বায়াস টার্ম এন্ড দ্য ইনস্ট্যান্স কন্টেইন দ্য ফিচারস ইফ ইউ ট্রান্সলেট দিস হোল থিং টু এক্সপ্লিসিট ওয়েটস এন্ড বায়াস ইউ গেট ইফ w transpose x plus b is less than equal to 1 then w is w times 1 minus r plus r c y x and then b is b times 1 minus r plus r c y else you just get the first part of it w is uh, uh, and to see that these two things are identical uh you just need to uh, everything here on this side that assume that the w's have a prime according to this definition here and just fit that in you should get the thing on the other side yeah is it zero why are you is there a oh yeah thank you yes thank you good excellent thanks uh if i was smarter i would say that i did it on purpose so that somebody you could catch it but i totally missed it um but yeah so the the weights uh do um uh, the contain a bias term as for the thing in the class um let me take a question in class and then go to this like a bunch of questions on zoom so you had a question in class yes um, question should have lost except that how okay, do we find a deep box is to just Look at this difference between the term and the term. Yes. But so we're also defining it by the loss of loss. Yeah, so that's the relative error. So that's the re relative improvement. You, because uh, I don't want to, uh, if I do not divide by the loss, then you're looking at the absolute difference. And uh, that might actually be a little slower. It might take, the, imagine that the loss values um, are um, um, in the range of, in the hundreds of thousands. So then the differences, let's say across epochs are in tens of thousands. Then it's going to take a lot of epochs for it to get to within say 10 power minus two. Instead, if you take the relative change, maybe the it's going to converge in the 10,000th range. And so it will take a lot of time for it to converge to within that uh, 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 position. So the relative error kind of takes out the scale. For doing this process, uh, you do it yeah, excellent question. So if you do this during cross-validation, then you're doing a lot of work. Uh, it's going to be super slow. For cross-validation, I would say just pick the number of epochs, set it to 10, and don't worry about it. For your homework, I would say even if you uh, pick the number of epochs for the learning uh, manually, I would not complain. But you know, in your report, you need to say what strategy you use. Okay, going back to Zoom. Um, do you calculate the objective function for SVM at the end of every epoch or between every example? Um, uh, so if you calculate, I, I would recommend do not calculate the, uh, the objective function after every example. There are certain... Um, there are certain technical issues with doing that. If you do that after every example, you're going to be, first of all, doing it very, very, uh, it's going to be super slow because you're going to compute the objective over the entire training data after every update. So it's going to be very, very slow. And I would recommend not doing that. Instead, uh, calculate the objective function across epochs and that will um, that will be a little bit thinner uh, for your computer mostly. It's it's a little uh, too much work if you have to calculate the objective value after every epoch. Um, do we initialize W and B to a small random number as we did with perceptron? That's an excellent question. Now, now that we have seen all these uh, different optimization approaches, the important point to note is with SVM, with logistic regression, and actually also with perceptron, if you uh, use a decaying learning rate, what we are doing is stochastic gradient descent with a convex objective function. If you have a convex objective function and you use stochastic gradient descent, 
you are guaranteed to convert to the converge to the minimum no matter where you initialize. So it doesn't matter where you initialize, initialize it to a small random number or initialize it to zero, it doesn't matter. It should not matter. And in fact, that's an interesting sort of a sanity check for your code. That said though, that advice does not hold for neural networks, for general neural networks. It only holds for one layer threshold networks. It also holds for one layer neural networks with a linear activation function. In other words, regression. It does not hold for general neural networks because your loss function is no longer convex. And that means your initialization might change where you your classifier ends up. And there the standard operating procedure is you initialize randomly and try that with multiple, try training not once, but multiple times with multiple random initializations and take report average across initializations. So we, we're just expanding the amount of training that we do. Uh, there's a question about, um, uh, so first of all, am I audible on Zoom? Because uh, apparently there are a few people saying that I'm not too audible. Uh, if I am not, post a message. So is getting F1 scores around 20 or 30 too low? Is this for uh, assuming the project, uh, the, the homework? I suspect it is actually a little bit on the lower side. Are people seeing more? People are seeing more. Uh, so, so F1 scores around 20 and 30 uh, is a little bit on the lower side. The highest the one I try to get is with, uh, with about 0 0.4, but it's still lower than 0.5. 0 0.5 means nothing here in F1, uh, in the context of F1. Um, because Did you have a... So the highest I see is 0. You are seeing 0 0.3 as well? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, that's a little... Uh, that's a little lower than what my recollection tells me, but if that's what it is, then that's what it is. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because as we see, as, as we, uh, some, some things to just keep in mind, a um, lot of people saw the uh, reported that uh, your classifier is always predicting minus one. Uh, that should not happen. Your classifier, the best classifier, I mean, if there are models that will always predict minus one but cross-validation will take them out. So your best hyperparameters will report, will predict both positives and negative. With F1, uh, unlike with accuracy, 0.5 is not a special thing uh, because it's possible that you can get an F1. If you get an accuracy less than 0.5 and your data set is equally, is, is balanced, then you can just flip the label of your model and you get a better classifier. That's not true for F1. Yes. Excellent question. So the, let me repeat the question. Uh, the question was in the class, in the last lecture, when I described F score and the precision and recall, actually, it was with respect to the positive label. It was precision of the positive label and recall of the positive label and F score with respect to that. Uh, Jacob's question is, can we, do we also need to calculate that for the negative label? Or is it just enough if you do it for the positive label? For binary classification, and only for binary classification, it's enough if you do it for one of the labels. Because uh, if precision, and it, if, I'll, I'll let you think about this offline, but uh, if you do it for one of the labels, you get a reasonable estimate of the quality of the model. Because if the model has, imagine that you were also doing, calculating, for precision and recall for the negative label, you can estimate it from the numbers that you have for the precision and recall for the positive label. Uh, if it gets perfect precision on the positive and very poor recall, uh, that means that it has predicted no examples as positive. That means it's predicted everything as negative, which means it has perfect recall on negative and poor precision on the negative. So you can kind of uh, estimate the behavior of the model on the negative label based on the positive precision and recall. However, if you have more than two labels, then the standard operating procedure is you compute precision recall for every label. Because then you can't, otherwise you can't, uh, you can't know the behavior on all of them. Um, could not hear uh, something about the project submission. How, how are we support, uh, supposed to submit during that period, uh, during the late period? During the late period, from 25 to 30, uh, 
you will not be able to make any submissions on Kaggle after 25, from 26 to 30. But remember, for your project, you're supposed to submit two things. You're supposed to make all those submissions on Kaggle and write a report that's about six pages uh, that describes what you did, what you learned, uh, what you observed, and so on. I'm willing to, uh, uh, you know, have no penalty till the 30th, but I cannot change the thing on Kaggle, but you know, you can spend the time on the report if you want. In a perfect world, I would recommend get it done by the deadline, and that way you won't have a project haunting you during the final period. But uh, if you can't get it done by the deadline, you will still have till the 25th or the 26th, check what it says on Kaggle, to sub make submissions on Kaggle, and you will have till the 30th to submit your report. Um, another question is, do you, uh, do we perform going back to the cross validation on the training set? Um, so are we supposed to perform cross validation only using the training set? Yes. You're supposed to cross to perform cross validation only using the training set because, uh, and you, you should not be using the test set to estimate any model behavior, any, uh, sorry, any model properties, including hyperparameters that are used to train the model. Because if you do that, then your test set is no longer a good estimate of the um, uh, of the model performance and your uh, it, it's it's considered bad experimental practice. So I strongly, strongly recommend for your project or in general, always do not look at your test set for doing cross-validation. Um, don't use one of the folds for, uh, uh, don't use the test set as one of the folds, yes. I know, I know. Uh, I, I'm fine, but you know there are good questions, and I don't want to make. I want to make sure that all the questions are taken care of. We have uh, today and tomorrow to wrap up neural networks. Can we get to questions in office hours? Okay. Thank you for the reminder, though. Okay. So normally at this point, I would say, are there any other questions? But uh, I feel we had a lot, so let's go back to the actual content of today. Today, we're going to talk about backpropagation. Uh, more specifically, today, we're going to talk about how neural networks are, going, are trained. And along the way, we'll encounter an algorithm called backpropagation. So to train a neural network, the uh, we are still operating in the supervised setting. So we assume that we have a training data. So we have a set of labeled examples, X and Y, and we need to learn the parameters of a neural network. Recall that a neural network is defined in terms of its architecture and its parameters. The architecture says what are the, which nodes are connected to what nodes in the neural network and what the activations are. And the parameters are what are the numbers, the weights on the wires. When we say we are training a neural network, we assume that the network architecture is given to us. How do we know the network architecture? We just, we just look somehow. And uh, we are going to just, uh, all we need to do is learn the weights of the neural network. Given the parameters and the architecture, the neural network is nothing but a function. It's just a complicated way of writing a function. Um, which means it can the, the it's a it's a hypothesis in the hypothesis space. Which means it can take an input and produce a label. So prediction with the neural network is simply uh, I'm going to write it in this way. It's some neural network. It's parameterized by weights w. I'm explicitly showing the weights here, uh, and uh, the input is x and the label is y. The la the predicted label here is y. How do you do this? Uh, this prediction process we covered this in the last lecture. This is the forward pass. The standard operating procedure for training neural networks uses the same recipe that we've seen so far many times in the semester. Um, we're going to look at, we, we, we use the idea of loss minimization. Uh, suppose we have the model, a classifier or a regressor, a neural network that's completely defined by its weight, given the fixed architecture. The goal of learning is to learn the weight. And the uh, way we do that is we define some loss function L. The loss simply is a penalty that this set of weights get 
for making a prediction, which is Nn of x comma w, for an example whose true label is yi. This is the same thing that we had uh, always. And that's the loss on one example. And the loss, if you have a full data set, you can accumulate the loss over the entire data set. And we set up an optimization problem for minimizing over all the parameters, uh, the total loss, finding a set of weights that minimize the loss. Sometimes there might be a regularizer involved to avoid overfitting. This strategy works for logistic regression. This strategy works for supported machines. It works for least mean square regression. It works for perceptron. The common thing across these things is that uh, each of these was a linear model. Uh, the first three here were all for classifiers. The last one was for regression, but they were all linear. So the same idea can be generalized to a nonlinear model as well. So concretely, uh, this was our running example that we had. Um, this is a two-layer neural network where x1 and x2 are the inputs. x0 is a bias feature that's always 1. v0 is a bias that's always 1. z1 is a neuron that uh, has a sigmoid um, uh, activation, and it's computed as a sigmoid transformation applied to sigmoid applied to a linear transformation of the input. v2 is another neuron with a sigmoid uh, activation computed in a similar fashion, but with its own weights. Given the values of v0, v1, and v2, the output is computed as simply the dot product of these three of a, this, this three-dimensional vector with the weights associated with the output neuron y. The output neuron has a linear activation, which is just a shorthand for saying it does not have any activation. So the output of this network is the number y. So what we have here is regression. The input is a two-dimensional vector, x1 and x2, and the output is a number one. Now suppose the true label for this example is the number yi. So we can compute the error that this particular model makes with these weights, with these all these weights. We can compute the error of this model uh, on this example. This is a regression. Uh, problem and the natural definition of the error here is the squared loss. The squared loss is simply asking uh, for us to take the difference of the ground truth and the prediction and square that number. You multiply it by a half because I'm going to take a, um, a, a derivative of this eventually. So I have a squared loss. So I can compute the output of this model using a forward pass. The thing in the dotted box is the forward pass. And then once I have the prediction, I can compute the loss. Nothing uh, surprise. Hopefully, there's nothing surprising about this because we've seen exact same thing, but with slightly different terminology for uh, SVM uh, and other cases. And so, we're back to this problem. We have a model uh, that's parameterized by the weight. I can compute a prediction in the previous slide that was y. And then based on that, I can compute the loss and I want to minimize this optimization problem. How do we solve this optimization problem? Any ideas? We only seen one optimizer in this class so far, stochastic gradient descent. If it worked for all those linear models, let's see if it works for these, these classes of models as well. So we can use stochastic gradient descent. It's exactly the same template that we saw so far. We have a set of, we have a training set. Um, I'm assuming that the inputs are d dimensional vectors and the output is some y. I'm not even committing to what that y is. If the y is uh, minus one comma one, then we, ha uh, we have a binary classification problem. We use the appropriate losses. If the y is a real number, then we use the appropriate squared loss. In fact, if the y is multi class classification, then we use a specific loss called the cross entropy loss. There, we uh, I'll mention cross entropy um, towards the end of this uh, unit. Doesn't really matter. We have uh, a training set. We also assuming that we also assume that we have the architecture of the neural network at hand. So the only thing that we need to learn are the parameters of that one. So the first thing we do is initialize the parameters. Notice here that I'm being. Uh, uh, vague about 
what I'm initializing the parameters to. For SVM, I said set the parameters to zero, initialize it to zero. But here, there are two important points. The first one, do not initialize the network weights to zero. If you initialize the weights to zero, then all the nodes in a layer are symmetric to each other. They are identical to each other, so they will get the exact same update. So they will never differentiate each other. They will never be different from each other. So it's it's an it's a bad practice to initialize the weights to zero. Second thing is the initialization matters because the con op optimization problem that we are solving here is not convex, which means we can only access get to a local minimum. By that I mean, if you have a lost surface that looks like this, if you initialize here, you'll end up here. If you initialize here, you'll end up here. If you initialize here, you'll end up in the same place. Here takes you here. I'm drawing these as like balls rolling down the hill. And so the initialization matters. So one of the uh, uh, good experimental practices is to initialize multiple times randomly and choose a model that's the best or choose the average performance across all the models that you get. And in two dimensions, this actually is easier. I mean, I'm able to draw this. In high dimensions, we can't even really uh, visualize the lost surface. All we know is it's non-convex. And as the models get larger, it's extremely non-convex. What I mean by that is the lost surface is extremely big. So initialization matters, can matter quite a bit. Anyway, so you, you initialize the model. And then learning proceeds in epochs. In each epoch, you shuffle the training data, and then you iterate over each example, and you pretend that the example that you're currently on is the entire training data. You compute the gradient of the loss function uh, for this example. Uh, basically, you define the loss function for this example. You compute each gradient with respect to the weights, and then you update uh, by taking the step a step in the opposite direction of the gradient. We have seen this before. We've seen this before a few times. So uh, the standard things that uh, uh, we've already encountered, the step size or the learning rate, there are many, many different tweaks that are possible. All we need is that the step size should keep decreasing as learning increases, uh, as uh, the number of epochs proceeds. But there are there's a the most uh, specific criterion. It should be square summable, the square of the step sizes from zero to infinity should be uh, should converge, meaning it should be less than infinity. But if you add up all the step sizes to infinity, that should diverge. It should go to infinity. Um, the versions that we saw before have that. Um, as I said, this the objective in general is not convex, so initialization matters. But the most important question here is: Have we solved it? Can you implement this? What's missing? We have the last function. Let's say that we have the last function. What's missing? Okay. The gradient. This step here, I mean, I kind of just slipped it in, compute the gradient of the loss function. Has it been easy? The problem is the gradient of the loss function entirely depends on the neural network. And the structure of the neural network can change. Today, maybe you want to try a three layer neural network. Tomorrow, you want to try out a 3000 layer neural network. Imagine taking the derivatives of that function by hand. Um, just imagine it, don't do it because uh, you are not going to be happy. But it's a painful process. So the derivative of the loss function is, um, it, it, it's a computationally tricky thing to compute. But we know that it exists. If the neural network is a differentiable function, in theory, we can find the gradient. Or more, actually, in general, not just the gradient, but the subgradient, because you might have a max thrown in somewhere. Yeah. And uh, the way that gradient is computed is, is uh, or the nature of the gradient depends on the choice of the architecture, the choice of the activation function, and such things. Computing the gradient or the computing the subgradient is easy for SVM because it's just a one layer neural network. It's, I would argue, easy for logistic regression. You're doing that in your homework. Also, it's a one layer neural network. 
it becomes painful when we have a more complex function. Um, in computer vision, for example, it's standard practice to have a neural network with about 100 to 200 layers. Um, transformer language models, the concept of a layer is also a little bit blurry there. But uh, in terms of number of parameters, there are billions of parameters involved. So obviously, we don't have someone ra computing gradients uh, by hand. We need an efficient algorithm that whose only job is to compute gradients of functions. And that algorithm is called back propagation. Yes. We talked about subgradient before. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have so, I mean, this leader, then yes. Um, and my question is the top line of whether it's something we talked about we need to um, compute by 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 the leader. Yes. And uh, all the activation functions we are considering are different. And by composing differentiable functions, you are keeping a differentiable. There is a whole interesting area of neural network research where you have non differentiable bits inside the network, but uh, we are not going to talk about that. So, back propagation is nothing but an algorithm that knows how to compute gradients. So, just to kind of take stock of where we are, if we have a neural network, we, we know its architecture, we know the activations, and we know all the weights. Then we know how to make a prediction for an input. If you have a labeled example, in other words, we have the inputs and the true label, then given the prediction that we just computed, we can also compute a loss. If the loss is a differentiable function, then and if we can take the derivative of the loss with respect to every one of the weights in the in the neural network, then we can perform a gradient step with SPD. So all we need is how do you take the derivative of the gradients? Before we talk about the backpropagation algorithm, any questions about where we are and how we got here? Let's talk about backpropagation. Actually, let's talk about derivatives. Let's look at some very simple functions. So consider this function f of x comma y is simply x plus y. Uh, this is a function with two inputs. So when I'm taking the derivative with respect to any one of these things, I have a partial derivative. So clearly, the partial derivative of f with respect to x is 1. Partial derivative of f with respect to y is also 1. If I have f of x, y is the product of the two things, then the partial derivative of f with respect to x is y, and the partial derivative of f with respect to y is x. Hopefully, this doesn't come as a shock. Okay. Um, the one thing that is not covered in Calc 3 or wherever you see this is uh, um, subgradient. If you have f of x comma y is the max of x comma y, then the partial derivative of f with respect to x is 1 if x is greater than y, otherwise it's 0. If uh, And the partial derivative of f with respect to y is 1 if y is greater than x, otherwise it's 0. And the way to think about it is to compute the partial derivative first, find the maximizer. If x is the maximizer, then take the partial derivative with respect to x. If y is the maximizer, then take the partial, sorry, take if x is the maximizer, take the partial derivative of x. If y is the maximizer, take the partial derivative of y. So if, in this case, x is the maximizer here. So partial derivative of x is 1. And if y is the maximizer, pa uh, partial derivative of y with respect to x is 0. So uh, uh, sort of a, because we're talking about optimization and optimizers, in all cases, what this represents is uh, the rate of change of a function f if there's a small change in the value of that particular x. We're not going to use this directly, but this is what motivates the use of the partial derivative and the gradients in general as a, uh, to take the gradient steps. But now let's take a more complicated case. Let's consider a function f of x, y, z 
is x times y square plus z. Notice that I'm not talking about your network. I'm not, I have no, nothing here is about your network. Everything here is just about how we, what, uh, how, you know, we construct mathematical functions in terms of complicated, uh, how we construct complicated mathematical functions in terms of small pieces and systematically take derivatives. Technically speaking, this function is small enough that you can just uh, take the derivative of partial derivative of this with respect to all of its parameters. That's not a big deal. You know, for example, what's the partial derivative of this function with respect to x? Y square plus z. You don't need back propagation for this, is my point. But let's make this a little bit more tedious. But it, every step is going to be small. Let's break this function down into two functions. I'll introduce a new function called g. g is nothing but g is really uh, g of y comma z is y square plus z and f of x comma anything, right? Let's call it f of x comma z is simply x times g. Both of these are functions that take two inputs and produce a number. Each of these is simple. It's simple enough that I can calculate the partial derivative of that function with respect to each of its arguments. So G has, so I can calculate what's the partial derivative of G with respect to Y, which is simply 2Y, for example. I can calculate the partial derivative of F with respect to G, which is simply X. So far, so good. Do you also agree that the F at the bottom is the same function as F at the top? So in, rather than worrying about that one, let's worry about the function in the middle. The key idea of backpropagation, and this is the only idea that keeps getting applied again and again. I think there are two pieces here, but the key idea here is something you, you've already seen in calculus, namely the chain rule. You break down a complex function into pieces take the, and use the chain rule of uh, derivatives to construct a larger derivative. So in particular, if I care about, in this case, the partial derivative of f with respect to y, that's nothing but the partial derivative of f with respect to g times the partial derivative of g with respect to y. Right? So I know how to compute the partial derivative of f with respect to g using that is simply x. And from here, I know how to calculate the partial derivative of g with respect to y, which is 2y, which means partial derivative of f with respect to y is 2 x y. What I have done here is um, essentially what backpropagation keeps doing, but in a more, in, a, in there's one more bit of cleverness that it uses, which uh, hopefully you'll start seeing very soon. But before we move on, any questions? Okay. Rather than writing the function in this way, I'm going to write it as something called a computation graph. It's just another representation for me to write down functions. Um, I have these two functions here, right? Uh, uh, f and g. I'm writing this graph. This node g has two inputs, y and z. And what is uh, not shown directly in the graph, but implicitly there is the information that g, that node, computes y square plus z. So what it does is it has two inputs. Let's call it left and right. I'm calling the left input y and the right input z. It squares the value of the left input and adds it to the value of the right input, and that is the output of that particular that particular uh, uh, node. The function f does not know about the existence of the function z. It has two inputs. All it does is, given its two inputs, it just multiplies it. So, given input left and right, f simply computes left times right. 
if we call the thing on the left x and the thing on the right g, then the node on top that I'm calling s computes x times g. Now, the question for you to think about is, first of all, this um, uh, computation graph, does it compute the same function as f? So it computes y squared plus z in the middle and then multiplies that with x. So it also computes x times y squared plus z. Except notice that it's making it very clear here that f does not really care, the, the, the node that is that I'm calling f here, does not really care that the input to it was actually the output of some other function. It just gets two inputs and multiplies them. It doesn't care about well, no, the fact that some of them, some of the inputs came from somewhere else. And that uh, allows, that property is useful to uh, kind of, uh, um, for the algorithm for back propagation to be mathematically correct. Yes. So should we worry about what that is going to be in a simple form, or should we just like ignore that? Ignore that for now. A computation graph is another form of the, it's actually a formal language um, for uh, defining neural networks. Every neural network corresponds to a computation graph. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about why that's correct. But because that's true, I should be able to compute a forward pass. In particular, I should be able to compute a forward pass on this function. So I can compute the value of this function when x is 3 and y is 2 and v is 1. Let's step through this process. When y is 2 and v is 1, then g takes the value 5, 2 squared plus 1. And because g is 5 and x is 3, f is 15. So when the input uh, 3 to 1 is presented, this network computes the value 15. All of this is building up to something called the backward pass. The backward pass compute the derivatives along every edge of this graph, starting from the top. So let's work this through from the beginning. And this is an example that we've already seen before. So I want you to compare to what we did before. So first, let's consider the input connecting x to f. Sorry, the edge connecting x to f. I can compute the gradient, the partial derivative of f with respect to x. I know the definition of that function. It's just simply the product, which means the partial derivative of f with respect to x is whatever the value of g was. We know the value of g, which is 5. So the partial derivative is 5. So I've computed the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and that's, the, that's 5. Let's consider the other part, the other input. The partial derivative of f with respect to g is simply x because it's the partial derivative of this product. We know the value of x, so I, I know that the partial derivative of f with respect to g is the number 3. Okay? Okay, now let's continue this process. Let's take this edge down. Here, I, when I'm going down this edge, I'm not computing the partial derivative of g with respect to y, but I want to compute the partial derivative of f with respect to y. And the cool thing to note is the partial derivative of f with respect to y is nothing but partial derivative of f with respect to g, which is this edge, times the partial derivative of f of g with respect to y, this edge. Why? Because of the chain rule. We've seen this before. So, Let's do that. The partial derivative of f with respect to y is the product of this partial derivative times the partial derivative of g with respect to y. Partial derivative of g with respect to y is simply 2y. So I can compute the value here and I get the number 12. And I'm going to do this one more time. We are going down this path here. The partial derivative of, oh, by the way, um, I'm not recalculating the value of partial derivative of f with respect to g. I don't need to recalculate it because I just calculated it above. I can just copy this number from here to here. Okay, let's do this one more time. The partial derivative of f with respect to, this can't be y, this has to be z. 
with respect to z is the derivative of f with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to z. This number here gets copied out to this, and the derivative of x of g with respect to z is simply you can cal calculate that based on that local fun that function de definition there. So it is simply one. <clears throat> So it is uh, the partial derivative of f with respect to z is three times one, which is three. I, at this point, one of two things must be happening. You must be getting bored because this seems serious. And the other thing is you must notice that I'm doing a lot of copying. Mm. I'm copying the number three from here, from here. I'm not recalculating that value. This is the second part of, second interesting thing in back propagation. The first one being, the repeated application of the chain rules. And the second interesting thing here is any partial derivative that's calculated, you cache it. And so that you don't recompute it. And that way, you save time. You, you save time by not doing any piece of work more than once. When I put it that way, it seems like an obvious thing, but it turns out that uh, it, it requires some thinking to uh, come up with that. Any questions about this version of backpropagation. I'll present the same thing again in the, using a different view. Yes. So we have to know what the derivatives are of the and we can't have the derivatives are of some functions. For what functions? Right. For example, um, whether for attributes that say this, so G, we have to know yeah. what the end of the derivatives are. That's right. That's a very good point. You have you you have to assume that there's a library of these uh, little pieces, building blocks, for for which you can analytically compute, for which we know the definition of the partial derivatives. It could be activation functions, but here's the cool thing. Suppose you write a computation graph composed of little building blocks that you own. And what is the interface that your computation graph has? Given any input that it takes, I can calculate the partial derivative of the output of that computation graph with respect to the input by, uh, without knowing how you implement it. Which means, as far as I'm concerned, it could be part of my library. Your so pieces, the, 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 your low-level pieces that you use to build a large computation graph does not do not matter to me because I can use your entire computation graph as a building block. I can do that because that whole thing has the same interface. It takes, given an input, I can do the forward pass. I can calculate the partial derivatives. I'm not, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a one step thing, but for you internally, it's going through this. Yes, yes. Which means that we can kind of share code uh, uh, that satisfies a certain interface. That interface is any computation graph should allow a forward pass. And it should allow the ability to compute the partial derivatives with respect to all of its inputs. And there's like a building block, a, a library consisting of many, many such building blocks that then you and I can use to construct more complicated networks. If you implement this library, then you would have implemented a competitor for PyTorch because that's what PyTorch is. Or TensorFlow or JAX or other such neural network libraries. You had a question. Um, you mentioned that we should cache when we think that we discover the database. Yes. Do we need to cache every single one of them, or is it just as we're going along? The as we're going from the top to the bottom. Okay, so there's no quiet and just like keep the new value, don't bother me. What old value? Um, if we go to calculate the path, okay, why the company has to be why. Yes. Um, and there were more nodes underneath that. We should keep the answer of FG, G line multiplied with each other because that would be even better. Yes, so you want to keep this value. You want to keep, yes. But we don't necessarily need to keep FG, the, the FG on its own. You might, yes. because it's possible that somewhere later on, this value is used somewhere else. It's possible. All we need is a directed acyclic graph. So there could be that might. There might be another kind. You never know. So, so we should have that note. You might want to keep all of them just to be safe because uh, it, it can lead to some savings. There might be some optimization of the kind that you're describing, 
But as a first cut, it is safer to just keep everything. Yes. Actually, that's an, that's an interesting question. You can actually estimate the partial derivative using numerical methods. And uh, I have seen early implementations of neural network libraries which have tried that, mm -hmm. and they found this is better. Okay. Because this is exact, mm -hmm. right? This is the actual partial derivative. There's no estimation going on here. And this tends to work better. Um, I remember around 2012 or so, I have seen that. And I've also seen some papers where they tried that. And this seems to be better. Good, uh, that's a good question. So I want to kind of uh, go back to this abstraction that I described. Every node in the graph knows two things. Given an input, it knows how to compute the output. So G knows how to compute the output given the values of uh, its two inputs. F knows how to compute the output given the values of its two inputs. And that's the forward pass. And it also knows, every node also knows how to compute the partial derivative of uh, its output with respect to each of those inputs. So the node G knows how to compute this local partial derivative and this local partial derivative. This one here. F knows how to compute the partial derivative with respect to its input. And these pieces, it assumes that every node can be defined independently of what's happening anywhere else in the graph. And because of this property, we can build up really complicated functions. Maybe today you want to use uh, the standard set of activation functions. Tomorrow you want to invent a new activation function that involves the square root of the sigmoid or something like that. You just build it up as uh, a composition of two functions, square root applied to sigmoid. Someone else implemented the partial derivatives for square root and sigmoid. You just have created a new node, which is a new activation function. You don't have to invent its uh, derivative because backprop will take care of it for you. So once again, uh, the, just to kind of remind you what these numbers mean, uh, the partial derivatives mean how sensitive is the value of f with respect to this input. So these numbers here, for example, uh, the f changes a lot more because the partial derivative of f with respect to y is bigger than uh, z and x. f changes faster with respect to uh, y in the neighborhood of 3 to 1. And so the update, if you want to minimize this function, that's the step that, that you want to kind of, you, you want to take a larger step in that direction. That's what the partial derivative gives you. Um, I, I'm going back to this example neural network here. Um, I mentioned uh, at the end of the last lecture that we use this notational convenience where the nodes in a neural network don't have to represent numbers, but they can represent um, collections of numbers like vectors or matrices or tensors. And, uh, you know, so I can write the input X as not a, sing a collection of numbers like this, but a single node that represents the entire vector. And then I have a matrix uh, uh, that's sitting on that edge there. This node Z simply computes WH uh, transpose, uh, or, or rather the product WH times uh, X and sigmoid applied to that element wise. And I can then think of the output as a node Y uh, parameterized by these three numbers here. And the output is uh, uh, simply Z times the vector, the vector Z, the dot product of the vector Z and the vector WO. This is just a notational convenience. But it turns out the same idea still applies. Um, by the way, the, this is a, there's no activation here because it's, um, uh, it's a linear a layer. Let's revisit that propagation. But um, uh, without using uh, computational graphs, but you're looking at maybe this neural network. The chain rule of derivatives, if you have x goes to z goes to y, the partial derivative of y with respect to uh, x is nothing but the partial derivative of y with respect to z times the partial derivative of z with respect to x. Because if y is a function of z and z is a function of x, y is a function of x as well. So we can apply the chain rule. Just a couple of uh, 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 extensions, not extensions, but a couple of uh, 
things that are worth noting here is sometimes you might see computation graphs like this. Why is the function of two things, v1 and v2? In fact, it is the sum of two things. It's the sum of a function of v1 plus a function of v2. And the z's themselves are a function of x. So how do you compute the partial derivative of y with respect to x? What you do is you first take a path along this direction. That's this thing here. From here to here. So partial derivative of y with respect to z1 times partial derivative of z1 with respect to x. Because y is a sum of two things, you add up the partial derivative as well. So it's partial derivative of y with respect to z2 times derivative of z2 with respect to x. You add those two uh, uh, sets of derivatives and you, are, you get the required uh, uh, gradient. This doesn't, it's not just about two things, it also applies to many things. If y is the sum of many functions of x, then the partial derivative is the sum of many partial derivatives. Given all these pieces, let's uh, instantiate that propagation uh, to this neural network and the loss function that we looked at. So the neural network is the one that we saw. The loss function, just as a reminder, is the squared loss. Here I'm using the notation y star to represent the ground rules. So the squared loss, is the, y is the prediction and y star is the uh, ground truth. And the error that this network makes is the squared difference between y and y star. We want to compute the partial derivative of L with respect to every one of these parameters in the neural network. Because then if we do that, we can take uh, the gradient, or sorry, we can take the gradient step. What we'll do is to apply the chain rule again and again. And importantly, anytime we encounter some information, we will save it because we won't, don't want to recompute the uh, previously computed partial derivative. That way we get some speed up. So I'm going to go through this uh, in a fair amount of detail. It's always worth implementing graph propagation once in your life. Um, just to get a feel for how annoying it is and then thank the people who uh, maintain PyTorch because you don't have to do it. But it's always worth implementing once in your life. Um, I remember doing it as an undergrad in a neural networks class. It was horrible. Um, but I would like to think I became a better person. Yeah, it was horrible. Uh, <laughs> but it's worth doing it because there are enough nuances here that if you actually implement it, you might actually see some nuances that you might miss when you watch someone talk about. Okay, so let's take the partial derivative of L with respect to W01. Speaking of which, uh, there's a story here. Uh, the back propagation algorithm is from the 1970s or 80s, and depending on whom you ask, uh, different people invent it. The name back propagation, uh, I think the usual citation that's used is to a certain chapter in a book from the 1980s uh, involving Jeff Hinton. But it turns out the idea existed in other uh, published literature in as early as the 1970s, and it has different names. Back propagation is a catchy name as far as the uh, name goes. Uh, but it's also sometimes called reverse mode auto differentiation. And there's a variant of it called forward mode auto differentiation, which is a different uh, version of uh, computing gradients. Uh, and I believe that it was first uh, it first showed up in a PhD thesis that was written in uh, a Scandinavian language, I think Finnish, maybe. And so it sat in some shelves uh, until it was rediscovered. Anyway, so let's uh, compute the partial derivative of L with respect to W01. Uh, the loss is not is not directly a function of w01, but it's a function of y, and y is a function of w01. So the partial derivative is the product of those these two things. But each of these two things, I know how to calculate the partial derivatives. So the partial derivative of l with respect to y is simply y minus y star. Partial derivative of y with respect to w01 is simply the number one. So I know how to calculate this partial derivative. The next one is the partial derivative of L with respect to W11. And if you think you know where this is going, you're exactly right. I'm going to go through each one of these. Um, the doors are locked. So 
the partial derivative of L with respect to W11. W11 is not W110. W11 is not a function of Y. Uh, uh, sorry, L is not a function of W11 directly, but it's a function of Y, and Y is a function of W11. Each of those partial derivatives are easy to compute. Um, partial derivative of L with respect to Y is Y minus Y star, and partial derivative of Y with respect to W11 is simply the number Z1. So we have both those things. We can calculate the product. But here we are seeing something interesting. This quantity is the same as what we saw here. So there's no reason to recalculate it because that's like two steps of computation that you can save. So we've already computed it. If we cached it, then we would save some time. Mm -hmm. And that's like an integral part of that propagation. Okay, I'm not going to do all of them. Let's just uh, skip and let's assume that all the partial derivatives are done and except for this last one here. So let's compute the partial derivative of L with respect to W22H, that highlighted weight. Now this one's interesting because L is a function of Y. Y is a function of um, Z2. Z2 is a function of the sigmoid. Sigmoid is a function of W22. So there's like a few steps that we have to go through. So the partial derivative of L with respect to W22 is simply the derivative of L with respect to Y times the derivative of Y with respect to W22. But Y is simply, uh, and I'm kind of skipping steps here, Y is simply that function there. I'm just plugging it in because I got bored of writing it. Um, so I can take the partial derivative this way. I, I can expand it out. That whole thing, uh, V1 is not a function of W22. So that is becomes, it turns out it will be zero. And when you, your backdrop will add the number zero there. So we are left with that. And V2 is a function of W22, but let's look at the definition. V2 is the sigmoid applied to some linear transformation. So let's maybe call the linear transformation S. So V2 is sigmoid of S. S is the linear transformation. So I can write um, the partial derivative of Z2 with respect to W22 is partial derivative of Z2 with respect to S times the partial derivative of S with respect to W22. Now, each of these pieces is simple. So I can calculate all of those pieces very, very uh, quickly. In fact, most of those things are actually already calculated. Partial derivative of L with respect to Y is that thing which is calculated which we've been calculating for every one of these things. So we picked it up from the cache. Partial derivative of Z2 with respect to S is Z2 times one minus Z2, why? Because Z2 is a sigmoid function. So, and when we talked about logistic regression, I said the partial derivative of a logistic, uh, the sigmoid activation is the sigmoid times one minus sigmoid, which is what we have here. And this is going to be part of any self-respecting neural network library. And uh, S is a linear transformation of the input, so we have this. And all these pieces are easy to calculate. They're part of the library. And so we can just plug them in and calculate the product. But there's something even more important here. We've already computed most of these partial derivatives because in, or in order to get to this thing, we've already calculated the partial derivative with respect to Y. We calculated the partial derivative with respect to the sigmoid because we are done with this one. So all we really need to do is this one extra step. The only extra calculation that needed to be performed was that one extra partial derivative and this product. Because most of the other stuff has already been um, cached. So, we, and the reason this caching works is because we're going from the top of the bottom. And the other reason why this caching works is because we have a directed acyclic graph. When I presented neural networks, somebody asked me, does this need to be a directed acyclic graph? Do we, can we have cycles? The answer is, if we had cycles, this algorithm will fail. And I'll let you think about that offline if that's not, uh, if it's not jumping out at you. I've gone through the backpropagation algorithm a few times in uh, using examples. It's the same algorithm that works no matter how many layers you have, what complicated architecture you have. It's literally the same thing that is used for computing gradients of um, 
the small one, two layer neural network that we have here and cat GPT. It's exactly the same uh, procedure because you, well, cat GPT has a lot more going on, but at least the first one, one step along the way is computing the gradient. It is considered such common, uh, uh, such a standard subroutine now that research papers don't even talk about back problems. All we see today in papers is we have this architecture of a neural network. We use this training data. We use this loss. We use this optimizer. That's it. The assumption is yeah. underneath the hood, back propagation is doing all the heavy lifting, and the optimizer is using the gradient to compute the thing. And there are all these hyperparameters that are somewhere are specified somewhere in a footnote of an appendix. This is like one of the most commonly used. Uh, algorithms today, because remember, the back propagation algorithm is you computing the gradient inside the innermost loop of stochastic gradient descent, which means it's doing that on every example or every small set of examples. And this happens again and again for every training pass, for training every single model, for every hyperparameter selection, cross validation, all that stuff. You keep calling back up. So if you can accelerate back propagation, you can accelerate a lot of machine learning. It's simply the repeated application of chain rules. There's a question. Yeah, can you copy your Nope. You run back, you run the forward, that's exactly what I'm right saying. You first perform the forward pass, you compute the value, then from the loss, you compute all the partial derivatives, then you get to the partial derivative of every way. You get a whole bunch of partial derivatives, then make an up. So you, you don't do that early up. Because if you do that, then your cached derivatives are no longer valid. There are variants that people have tried along these directions. So back propagation allows you to mechanize machine learning. It gives you the gradient that is used for gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, is a generic sort of a learning algorithm, actually some variants of stochastic gradient descent. And back propagation requires uh, 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 compute the, uh, the derivatives. There's a question on Zoom. What does back propagation add to perceptron? Because we know how to calculate the perceptron gradient. The answer is it adds absolutely nothing. Because perceptron, SVM, logistic regression are like the simple building blocks that I talked about. Um, where we know how to calculate the gradient by hand. It's for the more complicated cases where um, backpropagation is necessary. All modern neural network libraries are essentially Autodesk engines. They compute gradients using backpropagation or maybe using those other gradient computation methods like forward mode differentiation that I mentioned. Everything that I described fits inside the box there. You compute the gradient using back propagation, and then to answer the question that I said that you had asked, you then compute, you apply a gradient step. I'll stop here because we are at time. Um, in the next lecture, I'm going to spend some time talking about practical tips for neural networks. And I have office hours today if you have any questions.